today we are going to speak on a subject called how to check your contract for traps. We will start using alphabets of the English language as our main clues. The first thing I want to tell you about are the three P's. First P represents party, second P represents property and the third P represents price. Then I will speak about four T's terms, time, timing, termination. And then I would like to speak about other terms concerning exclusion clauses, arbitration clauses, force majeure clauses and foreign law clauses. There are more than four major areas we have to deal with. Then I would like to talk about three Ds which are damages, which concern normal damages, consequential damages, future damages and penalties. So let's dive straight into the subject. Three Ps. First P, party. You are entering into a contract called A Limited. First of all, go and examine whether the company called A Limited exists. For all you know, the person sitting in front of you may not be a person from A company. A company may in fact exist, but because this person is a fraudster, he may bring you all the stationery and all the materials, but he doesn't represent A company. Or he may be a real person. His name may be, for example, John or James. He may exist in reality, but he may represent a company called A company. The company may not exist or he may not exist. His name actually may be Henry, but he will say, my name is John's. So be very careful with the first P. When you're entering into a contract, be very careful with the first P. First P. Ensure that the person with whom you're contracting A exists, B is not a bankrupt, is a real person. And if it's a company, go into a company search. These things are very easily done. They're not expensive. Couple of hundred bucks. If you're entering into a hundred million dollar contract, a couple of hundred bucks will save you from a huge amount of grief later. The second P, property. You may, for example, intend to buy a house. Does that house exist? Are you buying a freehold or a leasehold property? Do a search on it. For all you know that the property he is selling may exist, but it may not be a freehold property. It may be a leasehold property. Do not get deceived. He may be selling you a machine, a bread making machine from say an overseas country. When you went to that country, you saw the machine and you're about to buy it. But will you get it? Will you get that same machine or a rusty version of it or an older version of it? Check that the property that you're buying is exactly what you want to buy. The third P is the price. You must pin down the amount of money or consideration that you're going to pay immediately. You may pay a hundred million dollars as part of the purchase price and you may transfer to that person a hundred million shares in a public listed companies. Or you may give him a piece of land, for example, in a particular place in London, you may give him 50 million pounds in cash and then you may give him some shares as the purchase consideration, lock it down and ensure that the money or the property doesn't walk over to the other side until they deliver to you what your property is. So use your lawyers in order to ensure that they hold the monies as stakeholders. Those are the three P's. Now let me deal with the numerous T's I've been speaking about. The first T is time. You really must understand and put it in your contract when does time start to run. You may buy a house or a machinery and he may say the seller that the contract starts on the 1st of January 2022. If you go and you pay your money and you realize that he in fact says the contract started in June of 2021, you would have lost six months. So make sure that time is set. The next thing that you have to deal with is timing. By this I mean sometimes the goods are to be delivered in parts. 
the, the machinery may be in four parts, they all independently working. The first set of A parts would be delivered to you, say in June of 2021, the second part in August and the third part in, for example, October of 2021. Ensure that he is able to send you these goods. Because of COVID-19, the airports may be shut down, ports may be shut down. So he may not be able to deliver those goods. Then you tell him you will not pay him those monies until, in fact, you receive delivery. Same also if you buy a property, a house, a landed property. Make sure that you check when these payments are to be made or when goods are to be delivered. Check the delivery as against the payment obligation. The next thing that you need to deal with, which is very, very important, which everybody overlooks is a contract is an agreement between two parties. You must not only think about making the contract a success. You must think about what's going to happen if the contract is unsuccessful. Can you walk away from a broken contract? So a number of lawyers use these words termination, breach and repudiation. So I'm now speaking about the 30 termination. Termination means the contract has come to an end. A breach means somebody is supposed to do something and he has refused to do it. A man is supposed to deliver to you a hundred thousand grade A eggs in May 25th. He doesn't deliver these goods to you. If he doesn't deliver these goods to you, he's in breach. He may correct that breach by sending you those eggs and ask you to pay money at a later time. So he's in breach. A person in breach means that person hasn't performed his part of the obligation. Breach doesn't mean termination. Then there's repudiation. Repudiation is a person who doesn't want to perform the terms of an agreement, but he also doesn't want to follow up. He wants to break it. For example, you have now decided to buy a property in the middle of London. You've agreed to pay for the land loan price, let's say 1.5 million pound sterling. So you have now gone forward and you've agreed to pay him the money. You have handed over the money to solicitors to be held as deposit and as the balance purchase price. And suddenly he calls you and tells you, I am sorry, I'm not selling this property to you. And uh, I do not want to go through with it because I found someone else who has agreed to give me a million seven hundred and fifty thousand pounds for it. Now that is not only a breach, he is refusing to perform in those circumstances. You can rush to the court, get an injunction, stop him from selling the property to a third party, put in a caveat, stop him from transferring the property and then get a specific performance order compelling him to deliver the property to you the moment you pay him all those payment obligations in the contract. So be very careful of these three words, breach, repudiation, refusal and termination, contract coming to an end. The next thing that you need to speak about is exclusion clauses. Somebody is delivering goods to you worth 20 million pounds sterling. These goods are machine parts from a particular country, for example, in Europe. Those goods are to be sent to you. This English company is sending you these goods. And he has a clause in the agreement that says, if we send you defective parts, you can't sue us. You can't do anything to us. You can't even sue us for damages. If while we are delivering, we injure somebody in Kuala Lumpur, for example, or in Singapore, then we are not liable. You know why? In the Singaporean jurisdiction or the Malaysian jurisdiction or the Indian jurisdiction, we are not liable for personal injury. Check that. Ask your lawyer to check. When someone tries to exclude liability, be very careful of those clauses. Ask your lawyer, is there anything where he's protecting himself, but by protecting himself, he's going to injure me and the aim of the contract. If it is, don't get into that contract. The next one is arbitration clauses. Unless you're going to enter into a contract that's worth a million US dollars or more, don't bother getting into an arbitration clause unless it's a consumer contract. Consumer contract is when you buy consumer goods and if there's a defect or the person doesn't perform, you can go to a consumer court. It's cheap, it's fine. But if you're entering into a commercial contract and it's worth less than it, if you're in the United States, a million US dollars, or if you're in the UK, 
million pounds sterling or in Europe, million euros, or even in Malaysia, million ringgit, Singapore, million Singapore dollars, do not enter into an arbitration clause unless you really want to because arbitration is expensive. Unless you have large amounts of money and deep pockets, you should never get into an arbitration. The next one is force major clauses. If you go into an agreement, it says if there is a disaster or there is a typhoon on the way while the goods are being transported, then what happens? He has agreed to send you the goods. You have received it at the airport. There is a COVID-19 breakout. You cannot remove the goods from the go-downs. The stevedore has not transferred the goods into the go-downs. And the other guy is saying, here's my bill of lading, pay it. And you can't pay because you cannot send it over to the purchaser. You're going to be in problems. Make sure the force major clauses are properly complied with. And if there are what are called escalation clauses, first you must do step one. Then you must do step two. Then you must do step three. Understand it very carefully and ensure that if anything goes wrong, you are in a position. I've done an essay on this. I'll show it to you. Shortly, there's also a video I did two years ago. Try and go and have a look at it. The next one is a foreign law clause. You enter into an agreement to buy some machinery from Austria, not Australia, Austria. And it's written there, this agreement shall be governed by English law. And you're living in Venezuela. If something goes wrong, then if you're going into an arbitration, then the law that determines your rights is English law. So if it's an English law, get an English lawyer to tell you what your rights are. Not necessarily an English speaking lawyer, a lawyer who understands the law in the United Kingdom. And the United Kingdom, as you know, is comprised in different components. Ireland, Wales, England, Scotland. Make sure that you get your law right. Those are the T's. Then I come to the three D's. When a contract has been broken, there are only two kinds of damages that the law in the Commonwealth jurisdiction caters for. The first is what both of you knew would be the damages. If you buy, for example, a particular kind of ceramic tiles from Germany and you're going to use it for your house and he sends it across to you, it doesn't fit for purposes and you paid him a hundred thousand pounds sterling or euros per square meter of the material and it doesn't fit, he has to pay you the damages for which you paid the purchase price. But what if you in fact install it in the way he is instructed, he is not liable for any other damage, but if it falls down and injures one of the workers and you are faced with a 1.5 million pounds suit in the middle of London, then what happens? Who is going to pay for that? So the courts will only give you damages that are naturally arising. An old English case called Hadley versus Baxendale. In India, it's section 75 of the Contracts Act. A similar provision exists in the British Columbia jurisdiction. In Malaysia, it's section 74, as is, I think, Singapore. Be very careful. Then there are consequential damages. Someone sends you some goods, you use them, and it causes poisoning, and somebody else dies. If the parties know that there is going to be this possibility and they catered for it, you can sue the party breaching the contract for this. I'll give you an example. In all English case, you sell some nuts for cattle. The cattle eat this food. All the cattle perish. But you were supposed to take the cattle and send them to another farm for a higher price than the price that you are having now. You sue the guy, the defendant, and he says, I will only give you the price of the nuts for which you paid. You paid me 1.5 million pounds sterling for the nuts for one ton. You can only ask me for that. So you say, no, no, my cattle died. You were the guy who was in control of the materials and the chemicals that went into the manufacture of this cattle food. You have to pay me for the price, not only of the cattle, but for the profits for which I was supposed to sell it. So it depends on whether both parties knew that this would happen. In those cases, you can get second level damages. These are known as consequential damages. The third one is future damages. Suppose you enter into a contract of insurance and something happens in the future and the insurer comes and says, no, I'm not liable for that. Oh, I'm not liable for this. Oh, I'm not liable for this. You have to check the contract. The last one is penalty clauses. Sometimes, particularly in building contract law, building contract agreements, 
there is a clause that says unless you finish the project within 18 months starting on the 1st of january 2019 ending a year and a half later you will be charged for every single day euros 300 thousand as penalty the first thing you need to do is whether in the jurisdiction that you're going to perform the contract that kind of penalty is allowed in the common law unless the parties have in fact suffered those damages and they fall within the accepted limits of the law of damages the court will not award it but in certain cases the law because of consumer protection will allow some amount of penalty clauses you have to be careful about these things so every time you walk into a contract ask your lawyers the three p question who is the party what's the price what's the property the 70s what are the terms what is the time what's the timing what is the termination clause when will there be breach when will there be repudiation are there exclusion clauses what does the arbitration clause say what about the force majeure clause what about foreign law jurisdiction clauses am i bound by this can i change them can i negotiate my way out of this then we spoke about the three d's damages first level damages second level damages which are consequential damages which is more difficult to get because unless both parties know the court will not award this cost so remember the three d's so those my dear friends are methods by which you can ensure that you don't put your foot into a trap just knowing these basic things i told you you will be able to have some understanding of how to get into a contract how not to get into a contract and you can have an intelligent conversation with a legal advisor on the other side or your own legal advisor so be mindful of these things thank you very much i hope this video has been useful to you please subscribe hit the like button ring that bell and share this widely with your friends have a good day and thank you goodbye